Hey, it's Darius. And if you didn't pass BEC, don't blame me. Because I could give you 91 reasons why all you got to do is get on the right road and you will pass. These students are much like you. They started out on Becker Boulevard or on Wiley Way or on Roger Road and they didn't make it. It didn't help them. So they came to me and they said, hey, Darius, I need you to do for me what you've done for so many others. And all I did was put them on I-75, taught them what they needed to know, either live one-on-one -on -one tutoring or they took my I-75 CPA review self-study course. They passed the exam and then they came back and left me beautiful recommendations like this so that you would know that all you got to do is get on the right road and you'll pass. Here's the deal. If we're first connections on LinkedIn, you could read these on my LinkedIn profile and then go hit some of these people up. Say, hey, what's with Darius? Is he really the kingmaker? Did you really watch his I-75 videos and then pass the exam? Look, if you didn't pass BEC, you know what that tells me? It tells me that you didn't know the difference, the difference between product costs and period costs. I'm serious. What if you had to write Right now in the written communication, the difference between product costs and period costs, could you write it enough to get maximum points? Well, that's one thing you're going to have to know the difference between. In order to pass BEC, you're going to have to tell them what costs go on the balance sheet and what costs are income statement expensed right away. If you didn't pass BEC, but maybe you knew the difference between product costs and period costs, you probably didn't know the difference between absorption costing and direct costing. And you're like, yep, that's me. Right, absorption costing versus direct costing when it comes to managerial accounting. What's the difference between the two? If you had to write, compare, and contrast absorption costing versus direct, when would net income be higher under absorption costing? When would it be higher under direct costing? Could you write it? Could you explain it? Could you identify it in multiple choice and choose the right answer? If you didn't pass BEC, that's probably one of the reasons why. The difference between operating leverage and financial leverage. Why is that important for a business? Well, operating leverage deals with how much of the company's operating costs are fixed. They can't do anything about them because they're fixed costs versus how many or what percentage of those costs are variable. Companies with higher operating leverage have a higher fixed cost as a percentage of total cost versus companies with low operating leverage, they have higher variable costs as a percentage of total operating costs. So operating leverage deals with your operating costs, whereas financial leverage doesn't deal with operating costs. It deals with how do you get your capital? How do you get capital? How do you buy your assets? Are you debt financed or are you equity financed? And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. So management could choose if they want to be mostly debt financed, which means they're taking more of a risk, but the reward is greater because if they win, if they do well, they get to keep all the profits because there's not a lot of stockholders to share it with. Versus if they sell shares and they don't issue debt, now they have a lot of partners, now they have a lot of stockholders, but there's less risk. So financial leverage versus operating leverage, you've got to be able to know the difference between the two and be able to explain what's the advantage of having high financial leverage, what's the disadvantage of high financial leverage, what about high operating leverage, what's the advantage, what's the disadvantage of high operating leverage. The good news is that the I-75 CPA review course, our BEC course, spends a good amount of time explaining in dream detail the difference between these two very important concepts, product cost versus period cost, absorption costing versus direct, operating leverage versus financial leverage. You've got to know the difference. And how do we do it? How do we explain it? We do it with a lot of good, well-placed, multiple-choice questions, just as the topics are delivered. If you didn't pass BEC, you didn't know the difference between the price variance and an efficiency variance. Here's the deal. Variance analysis, you know, is going to be on BEC. So you've got to know your price variances versus efficiency variances. 
For example, direct materials, there'll be a price variance. There'll also be an efficiency variance. And if you saved money buying cheaper material, well, your price variance will be favorable. But that might lead to an unfavorable efficiency variance for materials because since you bought the cheap crap, there might be a lot of breakage and you might have to start over with a lot of the production because of inefficiency with regard to the use. So you've got to know how to calculate price variances versus efficiency variances for materials, for labor, and oh yeah, for overhead as well. So if you didn't pass BEC, then you don't know the difference. But that's not all, because you probably don't know the difference between liquidity ratios and profitability ratios either. Because here's the best part. Ratios are going to be on all four parts of the CPA exam. They're going to be on BEC. They'll be in FAR, definitely in audit, and maybe even in reg. So you've got to know liquidity ratios versus profitability ratios. And while we're at it, you also have to know profitability ratios versus efficiency ratios. Now, how are they actually going to test this? They're going to test it in multiple choice. They're going to test it in simulation. And they might even test it in written communication. And that's why. Pick one of these a day. Every day, pick one of these and say, today I'm going to write the difference between product costs and period costs. Yesterday, I wrote the difference between profitability ratios and efficiency ratios. Tomorrow, I'm going to write about the difference between operating leverage and financial leverage. So that's how you're going to improve your written communication skills. At the same time, you get the finer points of these topics. Because as you write it, that's how you remember it. Here's the deal. You really want to pass BEC? You've got to know the difference. The difference between price elasticity of demand and price elasticity of supply. Why does this matter? Price elasticity of demand, what's that? It's the percent change in quantity demanded divided by the percent change in price. Businesses want to increase price all the time. So price elasticity of demand tells a company after the fact, after they've already raised price, what's the percent change in the quantity demanded after that price increase? After that percent increase in price, what percentage did they drop in quantity demanded? That's price elasticity of demand. Okay, then what's price elasticity of supply? Price elasticity of supply is the percent change in quantity supplied divided by the percent change in price. Price is expected to have the opposite impact on supply. If price goes up, there's going to be more supply, additional supply. If a company is already at full capacity, an increase in the price would lead them to want to increase supply, but they might not be able to. So an after-the-fact calculation like price elasticity of supply would tell a company how much that price increase impacted their ability to bring more supply to the marketplace. And any number less than one is said to be inelastic for both supply and demand. Any number greater than one is said to be elastic. In the video lectures in the I-75 course, we go through examples and multiple choice questions right at the same time we do the example. All I'm showing you in this video is the reason why you didn't pass BEC, because you didn't know the difference. And the reason is you didn't know the difference between conformance costs and non-conformance costs. Conformance costs are costs to keep the product up to a certain quality grade so that we don't have failure later on and a lot of angry customers. Non-conformance costs is the opposite. We failed as a product manufacturer probably because we didn't spend enough on conformance costs, so we wound up with a lot of non-conformance costs correcting failure later on. I can't emphasize this enough. If you didn't pass BEC, you didn't know the difference between job order costing and process costing. Job order costing is used when what you're making is unique. Your factory has many different jobs over the course of the month or over the course of the year, and each job is completely different. Think of a print shop. So one day they're making bumper stickers, and the next day they're doing results of earnings for a big company. 
and the next day they're producing a board game. So that's job order costing because every job is unique. Well then, what's process costing? Process costing is when everything that comes out of your factory looks the same. You're making ice cream all year, or you're making golf balls or pencils. So then you would just take the total cost and average it over the many units. So bottom line, the difference between passing BEC and failing is right here on this slide. And what should you do right now? Well, pick one of these. See if you can write, compare, and contrast the difference between price variances and efficiency variances, between conformance costs and non-conformance costs, and then pick a different one and write about it tomorrow. If you want to know whether a CPA review course can help you or not, go to the recommendations. See who's got what to say and hit some of those people up. They're all right here on LinkedIn. This list goes on and on because people come to me just like you every day and they say, hey Darius, I need you to do for me what you've done for so many, for all those people in your Hall of Fame. I want to be in your Hall of Fame. Help me. And I say, all you got to do is get on I-75. Nobody has a list of recommendations that reads like this. Not Becker, not Wiley, not Ninja, not Glime, none of them. Not Roger, not even the New York Yankees have a Hall of Fame that look like this. It just goes on and on. It's endless. I'll save a spot for you in my LinkedIn Hall of Fame.